reading for today, words of David, are taken from Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another god multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or you do not let me see the pit of hell. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Thanks be to God for the goodness of the word. Well, this morning, for an unusual beginning to my lesson, um, I ask you to support me with energy and hold me up as I'm going through my fourth week now of whatever this respiratory thing is. Uh, the doctor has not been given, has not been able to give me an answer or find any easy uh, treatment. So we all have our challenges from time to time and mine is maintaining the energy to stand here this morning. So um, it's a time in humility that I ask for your support. Our lesson today is what is practical Christianity? Our founders Charles and Myrtle Fillmore developed this term, practical Christianity, early in the unity movement. They loved playing with the term. There are lots of examples of unity's letterhead with this term, practical Christianity, being, uh, let's say, experimented with. They'd say practical Christianity for practical Christians. Then they'd change it to practical Christianity for practicing Christians. Or... What is practical about Christianity? They would play with this term, but it wasn't just a word game. They were, in the early years of unity, trying to capture what you might call the unity idea. What is the essence that unity is all about? What was unity offering? early in its meetings and activities, its prayer work. Um, what was it offering to the community? What was it offering to the world? Now, Christianity is known, experienced, practiced, described in many ways. We know traditionally in the last 2,000 years that all Christian churches, in one way or another, express the sacraments, the holy activity of communion, baptism, the rite of marriage, the rite of holy orders, the rite of healing the sick, the rite of confession. 
and I left out confirmation. Anyway, seven sacraments in the Christian tradition that are seen to have blessing power. Then we have Christian theology. That is, the idea of what is Christianity all about. Again, the church in its early centuries struggled mightily, and it struggled with such fierceness that there were times that people lost their lives, including bishops that did not teach what other bishops thought was the correct truth, the orthodox, that's what that word means, the right thinking, the correct thinking. And so Christianity as theology became a very important part of its history, describing the truth and the nature of Jesus Christ, the relationship of the human being to its creator and through an idea of salvation or saving for the individual through Jesus Christ. So we could talk about Christianity as a theology, um, a religious idea, and dwell and meditate upon that. But in the late 19th century, there was a movement which became known as the New Thought Movement, and it included the work that developed as the Unity Movement, also divine science, religious science, homes for truth. Um, it had a relationship to Christian science, although uh, the Christian Science Church always kept its distance from new thought and uh, felt that it was not a part of that movement, but others often brought Christian science into that movement. But in the 19th century, there was suddenly this new thought. What did Jesus do? Now, we've heard that statement in the media and in our modern culture. When we come to a real quandary, asking ourselves, what would Jesus do? And so this movement developed, and soon they realized, and the Fillmore certainly were a part of this work, that healing, healing was the great ministry on earth of Jesus. According to the Gospels and the stories, Jesus went about meeting people where they were, he did not sit on a mountaintop and wait for people to come to him. He was in the world, met people where they were, and then supported them in their own awakening or realizing the goodness of their God. And in that they found healing. They were restored. So unity placed a great emphasis upon the power of prayer in this healing process, even recognizing the presence of Jesus Christ in the prayer process leading to healing. And if you know the early work of unity, there was a great deal of stories about healing people constantly writing into Unity Magazine with their testimony of the healing that they had experienced in praying with Unity and in using the Unity principles in their life in a practic practical way, in a way that made a difference. And so many people have come to Unity over the years when, and this is not a criticism, because there is great divine wisdom in the theology of Christianity. There is great power in the sacraments or the holy acts of Christianity. But there is also 
a place for Christianity to be a way of life, as Unity described it and continues to describe it. I want to share with you a brief reading that speaks to this awakening process. It comes from a book by Mark Nepo, The Book of Awakening. And this book has become quite popular in unity circles over the last, oh, I'd say five years or so. It is essential to realize and embrace the paradox that while no one can go through the journey, excuse me, while no one can go through your journey for you, you are not alone. Everyone is on the same journey. Everyone shares the same pains, the same confusions, the same fears, which if put out between us, lose their sharp edges and cut us less. A very touching story from the Talmud captures this soft paradox of how we all journey together. A rabbi asks his students, how do you know the first moment of dawn has arrived? How do you know the first moment of dawn has arrived? After a great silence, one student pipes up, when you can tell the difference between a sheep and a dog. The rabbi shakes his head, no. Another offers, when you can tell the difference between a fig tree and an olive tree. Again, the rabbi shakes his head, no. There are no other answers. The rabbi circles their silence and walks among the students. Then he says, you know the first moment of dawn has arrived when you look into the eyes of another human being and see yourself. Unity attempted in many ways, but the most essential way, to make a practical way of life out of the teachings and principles taught to us by our Master Jesus Christ, formed five principles. And these principles of unity are taught and proclaimed from our world headquarters in Lee Summit as the essential teaching even to this very day. Books are written when unity is asked what it's all about. These are the principles that are given. So it's always good to review them from time to time. One is stated in our statement of faith, which we have at the beginning of the service now. It's expressed in different ways, but it's essentially this. There is one presence and one power in our lives and in our world. God, the good, all-powerful. This is the source of our very existence. The second principle, the perfect idea of being, the Son of God, the Christ, is within every human being as the master pattern. Charles Fillmore had a interesting way of saying that that uh, I liked because he and I both love long words. And so he hyphenated together this idea by saying the perfect idea of man in the mind of God. In other words, the perfect image and likeness in which God created the individual. The third principle, the spiritual human being is given a divine inheritance of creative power. 
In unity, we call it the law of mind action. Creative thoughts in the individual have results in the world. This goes back to the idea that we're created in the image and likeness of God. God is creative, and we as individuals are creative in this world. Through our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions, we have a creative result in the world. Perhaps a more popular way to express it is to say each one of us makes a difference. And so this spiritual path is to become ever more aware of the difference we make in our world. The fourth principle, the individual develops in soul and spiritual awareness through consistent practice of prayer, meditation, silence. Whatever terms or techniques we use, it is essential to rest our attention in God as our source and power to create good. Charles Fillmore, in his Midwestern way of speaking, would often call people to task, I guess you would say, in his Sunday lessons, when he would say, you, you, want, you want and expect the blessings of God in good health, in prosperity, in good opportunities and work and in your community, then be willing to spend some time in the silence and let God instruct you. Let God speak to you. Give you creative, helpful direction in your life. On another time, on another occasion, he expressed a similar idea that I've been working with this week myself, and that is, and this shocked many people in his auditorium, when he would say, when you spend more time thinking about your divine life than the illness you're experience, experiencing, you'll be healed. When you put the focus upon the divine life within you, rather than dwelling so completely in your sickness, you will be healed. And our fifth principle, some people express it in a, um, oh, what would you say, a popular phrase by saying it's not enough to talk your talk, you have to walk your talk. Another way to put it more formally, it's not enough to pray and think on these principles, we must express them in our daily actions and how we act in the world and how we treat others. What we do and how we relate to others makes a difference. Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, since they based unity, or I should say they expressed unity, with the idea of the modern thought of science, organized knowledge, um, knowledge that was dependable. They expressed this fifth statement as you must demonstrate, like a scientific experiment, you must demonstrate the truth you know. And of course, this reminds us of Jesus' statement, you will know the truth, and the very truth you know will set you free. It's not enough to dwell on these ideas inwardly. We have to demonstrate and put them into practice outwardly in our world. 
Now, we each have our individual challenges to meet or our opportunities. This does not have to be a negative discussion. We have opportunities to meet through which we grow in our understanding, in our compassion, in our skills in life, we can say. And at this time, and I'm not so, I'm not so sure that it's different from any other time through history, that the human family worldwide is struggling with those who choose to take the divine creative powers and use them destructively to cause harm. And we cannot ignore that and be a helpful presence to our world. But I couldn't help but recalling those famous words you all know from Franklin Roosevelt when he cautioned people during the Depression, a time of great difficulty in America. And he said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And I speak, think this speaks dramatically to this day and age when there is a great deal of talk about terrorism and about the things that are happening around the world. And as I said, it's important. We accomplish nothing. We do no good. We're no help to the world if we put our heads in the sand and say, oh, no, 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 I never watch the news. I don't want to know about anything that's going on outside Sunrise Beach. No, it is important that we are aware because we are part of the human family. That awakening, according to Mark Nepo, that dawning for us of a new day comes when we look in the eyes of another human being and see ourselves. And so it's a great responsibility and challenge and a possibility of fear when we do not turn our attention away to violence and harm that's going on in the world and recognizing that those individuals are a part of us. We are a part of them. Because if we allow the terror or the fear to develop, it is taking our attention away from our truth and centering us completely in fear to the point that we can become ultimately unable to do anything for ourselves, for anyone else, unable to make the world a better place. What would Jesus do? Well, we know from the record of the Gospels when he went into dreadful places, communities where they can find the lepers because they didn't want those with leprosy right in the city among the people. So they were shunned and put in a faraway place by themselves, almost one could call it a hell of leprosy. But Jesus went to meet them because he was not afraid. He was there to see that connection with every human being in whose eyes he looked. And so we may wonder in this time, what, did, what is it that I, as an individual, can do? 
what is it that I as an individual can do? Well, as we begin everything in unity with prayer, I can make sure that I'm finding a balance in my life between my inner prayer work, however you do that, and the attention you give to the bad news of the world so that you maintain your strength inwardly. Then, too, you can use the power of prayer. For those that you do not know by name, those perhaps quite far away from us here in Sunrise Beach, and affirm the presence of spirit in their life, to affirm the wonderful courage and compassion and goodwill of their own communities to meet these times of catastrophe or disaster. And two, in prayer, you can also ask, what is mine to do in the world? And your answer will be unique for you. You will find your own answer in what you choose to do in your community, what you choose to do in your political life, what candidates, what programs, what ideas you choose to support. I cannot answer that for you. You can only find that answer within yourself. So I wanted to close with a time of meditation. And this is a brief prayer that has been around unity a long time. But it's a simple visual image that you can hold in a time of prayer and silence. It's given the name the broom prayer the broom prayer. And there's one thing I want you to notice uh, as I speak it. It is first a statement of cleansing, sweeping away, and then comes the affirmation of gathering. And there's one important distinction. I was taught this by a much older teacher in unity. When we are doing the sweeping away, we never include in that statement people. We never sweep people away as if trash. But in the corresponding gathering of the prayer, Yes, we can gather people around us in this process, but we never discard them. So I invite you to close your eyes. We just allow ourselves to center our attention in this moment. All is safe and secure in this sanctuary. We are very blessed to have this spiritual family in which we can come together in prayer and know that each one here holds one another in love and in respect. We ask the Holy Spirit, the great comforter, to guide us and help us in this process of release and gathering.
So I imagine taking up a broom and declare I gently sweep away all thoughts, feelings, and actions in my life that are not in full harmony with the Christ standard. With the help of the Holy Spirit, I now gently sweep away from my life all thoughts, feelings, and actions that are in not that are not in complete harmony with the Christ standard. I give thanks for the activity of Holy Spirit which helps me accomplish this release, this cleansing within. And now I ask the Holy Spirit to empower me in this affirmation. I now gather round me all thoughts, feelings, actions, and people who are in harmony with the Christ standard. I now gather around me all thoughts, feelings, actions, and people who are in complete harmony with the Christ standard, that image and likeness in which God has created us. And so we give thanks for the activity of Holy Spirit and the attractive power of our mind to creatively draw around us a community of goodwill, good deed, compassion, and respect. the true world in which each one of us deserves to dwell. Gently, we allow our attention to once again become aware of this outer sanctuary and the friends in this room And as we are ready, we gently open our eyes and say, Amen, this is my truth.